The Lost Terrain by Garrett Garrett First published in 1953 1. Between government in the Republican meaning, that is, constitutional, representative, limited government, on the one hand, and empire, on the other hand, there is mortal enmity. Either one must forbid the other, or one will destroy the other. That we know. Yet never has the choice been put to a vote of the people. The country has been committed to the course of empire by executive government, one step at a time, with slogans, concealments, equivocations, a propaganda of fear, and in every crisis, an appeal for unity, lest we present to the world the aspect of a divided nation, until at last it may be proclaimed that events have made the decision, and it is irrevocable. Thus, now to alter the course is impossible. If that were true, then a piece of writing like this would be an exercise in pessimistic vanity. Who says it is impossible? The President says it. The State Department says it. All globalists and one-worlders are saying it. Do not ask whether or not it is possible. Ask yourself this. If it were possible, what would it take? How could the people restore the Republic if they would? Or, before that, how could they recover their constitutional sovereign right to choose for themselves? When you have put it that way, you are bound to turn and look at the lost terrain. What are the positions, forgotten or surrendered, that would have to be recaptured? 2. The height in the foreground is a state of mind. To recover the habit of decision, the people must learn again to think for themselves, and this would require a kind of self-awakening, as from a wee small alarm in the depths. This is so because thinking has been laid under a spell. The hypnotic powers are entrenched, combative, and dangerous. But once the self-liberated mind had regained that first height, it would see not only that there is an alternative course, but that above the noxious emanations of fear and the fog of propaganda, the view of it is fairly clear. On December 20th, 1950, Herbert Hoover pointed to it, saying, quote, The foundation of our national policies must be to preserve for the world this Western Hemisphere Gibraltar of Western civilization. We can, without any measure of doubt, with our own air and naval forces, hold the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, with one frontier on Britain, if she wishes to cooperate, the other on Japan, Formosa, and the Philippines. We could, after initial outlays of more air and navy equipment, greatly reduce our expenditures, balance our budget, and free ourselves from the dangers of inflation and economic degeneration. We are not blind for the need to preserve Western civilization on the continent of Europe or to our cultural and religious ties to it. But the prime obligation of Western continental Europe rests upon the nations of Europe. The test is whether they have the spiritual force, the will and acceptance of unity among them by their own volition. America cannot create their spiritual forces. We cannot buy them with money. End of quote. His words were lost on the spellbound American mind. The government's propaganda smothered him. He was an isolationist back from the grave. Will you take a military authority for it, even though it speaks against itself? Addressing the American Legion at Miami... On October 17, 1951, General MacArthur said, quote, It is impossible to disassociate ourselves from the affairs of Europe and Asia. Major warfare in either has become our immediate military concern, lest they fall under the domination of those hostile to us and intent upon predatory incursions against our own land. End of quote. The global thesis, as any globalist would state it. Then, amazingly, in the same speech, three paragraphs later, MacArthur said, 
quote, There are many of the leaders and people of Western Europe who mistakenly believe that we assist them solely to protect ourselves or to assure an alliance with them should our country be attacked. This is indeed fallacious thinking. Our potential in human and material resource, in alignment with the rest of the Americas, is adequate to defend this hemisphere against any threat from any power or any association of powers. End of quote. The fascinated American mind hardly noticed this startling discrepancy in MacArthur's reasoning. If the American hemisphere is invulnerable, then why do we have to defend American liberty in Europe, Asia, and Africa? The question is not arguable here. The purpose of asking it is merely to show that it does exist. In Foreign Policy for Americans, Senator Taft evidently thought he was discussing the principles of foreign policy, whereas, in fact, he was discussing only its history and its faults, and how now to go on with it, saying, quote, I see no choice now except to rely on our armed forces and alliances with those nations willing to fight the advance of communism, end of quote. Then he adds one sentence, as honestly he must, saying, quote, in my opinion, we are completely able to defend the United States itself, end of quote. There, the discrepancy again. If we are completely able to defend the United States itself, why do we have to rely upon allies? The Pentagon itself has plotted an alternative course. That fact is not disclosed by the government, on the ground that to disclose it would be, in its opinion, contrary to the public interest. Military support for the government's course, that may be disclosed, that is in the public interest. If it be denied that the Pentagon has an alternative plan, the answer is that in such case the people ought to fire the general staff and get a new one. If it is still permitted for people to say what they will defend and how they will defend it, to choose, for example, whether to save the United States or save the whole world, why should they not have all the military information there is? Why should the government withhold part of it? Whose property is it? Does it belong to the government or to the people? Strategy must be secret. We do not speak of strategy. We speak of national policy. 3. The second height to be regained is that where of old foreign policy was submitted to public debate. How long ago that seems, and how was that height lost? There was no battle for it. The government seized it without a struggle, and now the president may say the people ought to accept the government's foreign policy without debate. In a speech to the National Women's Democratic Club on November 20th, 1951, President Truman said, quote, You remember what happened in 1920, when the people voted for Harding, that meant a tremendous change in the course the United States was following. It meant that we turned our backs on the newborn League of Nations. I think most people now recognize that the country chose the wrong course in 1920. Since I have been president, I have sought to steer a straight course of handling foreign policy matters on the sole basis of the national interest. The people I have chosen to fill the major positions concerned with foreign policy have been picked solely on merit, without regard to party labels. I want to keep it that way. I want to keep our foreign policy out of domestic politics. End of quote. So far had the American mind been conditioned by the infatuate phrase bipartisan foreign policy that this extraordinary statement was vacantly received. What was the president saying? He was saying that because, in his opinion, the people once voted wrong on foreign policy, they ought not to vote on it at all, any more. Let them leave it to the president. It follows logically that the people have no longer anything to say about war and peace. On this height, where foreign policy once more shall be debated by the people who may have to die for it, let the wind be cold and merciless. Let those be nakedly exposed to it who have brought the country to this impasse. 
who so misunderstand the nature of what they have done that they find no ignominy in having brought national security to rest upon the goodwill of boughten allies. If it is so, who petted and nourished the Russian aggressor and recommended him to the affections of the American people as a peace-loving collaborator, if they can justify themselves to the free and disenthralled intelligence of the people so that the people knowingly choose to go on with them, then there will be nothing more to say or to do but decently to perform the obsequies of the Republic. Until this is settled, it will be useless to discuss domestic policies, because what is at stake in the first case is the fate of the Republican form of government. 4. On the next height lies control of the public purse. Until the people have recovered that, they cannot tame executive government. Passing laws to control or restrain it is of no avail whatever. The only way to reason with it is to cut it off at the pockets. Until the Roosevelt Revolution, even from colonial days until then, no popular prerogative was so jealously guarded as this one. The colonists insisted on paying the royal governors out of colonial funds because if they were paid by the British Treasury, they would be too independent. And when it came to setting up the American government, the Constitution said that control of the purse should be in the hands of the House of Representatives, because that was the popular side of Congress. The people have not always managed the purse well. They have sometimes stuffed it with bad money. They have sometimes flung its contents around in a reckless manner. But there is this difference that no matter how badly the people may manage the public purse, it cannot control them. Whereas, in the hands of the government, control of the purse becomes the single most powerful instrument of executive policy touching the lives of the people. 5. There is no valley to cross to the next height. It is right there. On top of it is the nesting place of the fallacious serpent. The spirit of insatiable evil inhabits the serpent. The evil is inflation. Its weapon of defense is an invisible vapor, the effects of which is to cause people to become economic alcoholics, afflicted with the delusion that they can get rich by destroying the value of money. It is no good to think of cutting off its head. It has millions of heads, all in the likeness of human heads, and as fast as they are chopped off, others appear in place of them. Moreover, at this point, even in the ranks of the dragon hunters, dissensions will break forth, people saying, Don't kill him. If he dies, deflation will come, and deflation is worse. Only chain him down. At that, every one of the heads begins to grin in a most sardonic manner, the serpent thinks its life is safe, and to wiggle out of chains is its morning exercise. There is only one thing to do with the monster. It can be sickened and starved, not to death, because the life of it is immortal, but to a harmless shadow. Its food is irredeemable paper money. Sound money is its poison. Victory here cannot be unconditional. You will have to leave a guard and then someone to watch the guard, and then keep going back to sea. 6. The positions in the lost terrain that have been named are vital. To serve the Republic, they must all be stormed and captured. Others are important, but if these are taken, the others can wait. But there is still one more, the last and highest of all, and as you approach it, you may understand the serpent's sardonic grin. The slopes are steep and barren. No enemy is visible. The enemy is in yourself. For this may be named the peak of fortitude. What you have to face is that the cost of saving the Republic may be extremely high. It could be relatively as high as the cost of setting it up in the first place. 175 years ago, when love of political liberty was a mighty passion and people were willing to die for it. When the economy has for a long time been moving by jet propulsion, the higher, the faster, on the fuel of perpetual war, 
and planned inflation, a time comes when you have to choose whether to go on and on and dissolve in the stratosphere or decelerate. But deceleration will cause a terrific shock. Who will say, now? Who is willing to face the grim and dangerous realities of deflation and depression? When Moses had brought his people near to the promised land, he sent out scouts to explore it. They returned with rapturous words for its beauties and its fruits. Whereupon the people were shrill with joy until the scouts said, The only thing is, this land is inhabited by very fierce men. Moses said, Come, let us fall upon them and take the land. It is ours from the Lord. At that the people turned bitterly on Moses and said, What a prophet you have turned out to be. So the land is ours, if we can take it? We needed no prophet to tell us that. No doubt the people know they can have the republic back if they wanted enough to fight for it and to pay the price. The only point is that no leader has yet appeared with the courage to make them choose.